Um, we do have two missing candidates, I'm sure you've noticed. Uh, the rescheduling of Education Day was today, and Helen and Jonathan are going to join us as soon as they can following that. So we will start as planned uh, with the two candidates who are able to make it here. And thank you to Chris Horn and for David Seaman for making it for us today. Thank you very much. Are you going to introduce yourself? Myself? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Rebecca Shaw, and I am one of the co-organizers for Como for Progress. Race Matters Friends invited us to come in with this uh, wonderful candidate forum. We're excited to help out tonight. And I'm Peggy Placer from Race Matters Friends, substituting for Tracy Wilson Kleekamp, whose husband broke his leg. And that's a long story, but it's, it's, it's not good. You may have noticed the sign for voter registration. If you are not registered to vote or if you need to update an address because you've moved, please fill out those forms at the end of the forum tonight before you leave. And you can drop them off with the Boone County Clerk or stick them in the mail. And once you do have your card with the question written, if you do decide to do that, Karen, who is somewhere, has a basket, and we're going to put them in the basket. Here we go. And then sort through them so that we'll be ready. All right! I come here again. <laughs> that is great. Good to see you. Good to see you. Junction should be here shortly. So we have three out of four, and that'll be great as we get started. Okay. We're going to allow about two minutes for each candidate to introduce themselves. So we will start with David on my left. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is David Seaman. I am originally from Columbia, South Carolina, um, but I moved around a lot as a kid. Uh, about four different schools in four different school districts um, Columbia, South Carolina, Atlanta, Colorado Springs. Finally settled here in 2003 at, uh, at Rockbridge. Um, the summer before my senior year, uh, my father passed away. Uh, that August, my wife, then girlfriend at the time, uh, told me she was pregnant. And the next day, I started my senior year of high school at Rockbridge. Um, going through that 11 to 9 to 11 month period, trying to figure out how to become a father while losing your father, um, while doing everything that happens in your senior year of high school was pretty tough. Um, and I always say that the only reason I was able to survive that was because I have a strong family. And the only reason I was able to graduate high school that year was because of the teachers and counselors and educators at Rockbridge. They were, uh, for lack of a better term, angels. Um, some of them are still involved in my life today. And they are the reason that I am sitting here before you as a high school graduate, college graduate, and Marine Corps officer. Um, we moved back here after my time in the military because we wanted to ensure that we gave students in CPS the same opportunities that I had, that my wife had. Um, because without CPS, I, I don't think I'd be sitting here in front of you today as a candidate for school board. So uh, I appreciate you all coming out. I'm looking forward to your questions, and I assume they're probably gonna be difficult, but we'll figure it out together. Thank you. Uh, hey. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Horn. Um, kind of similar background to David's in that uh, I'm not from Columbia. My parents were in the Air Force, um, so I had the, uh, the fortune, I guess you can say, to move around every four or five years. Um, I spent my elementary and middle school years in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and did high school in O'Fallon, Illinois. I arrived in Columbia at the University of Missouri, um, and in total, I've been here about 10 years. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a husband to uh, my wife works in the uh, in the Columbia Public School District. It's one of our good schools. At uh, all of our schools are good, but at uh, Ridgeway Elementary, and I've got uh, three beautiful young children. Um, you know, the majority of my time here in Columbia, um, I believed that certain schools were better than others. Um, that's kind of the message that I have received um, in my time here, going to school, starting to work. Um, that all changed for me in 2019. I did Leadership Columbia, uh, two of my favorite days, Social Services Day and Education Day. Um, and it was at Education Day when I found out that what I was told and what, what I believed was not true. Um, that's when I discovered that all of our schools are good. We've got a fantastic school district here. Um, and so learning that, 
learning more about myself, you know, learning more, more about some of the, the agency that I carry, the privilege that I carry throughout this world. Um, I knew better, so I wanted to do better. And so that's, that's why I'm sitting in front of you here today. Um, uh, you know, as fantastic as our school district is, we have some work to do. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm all about equity and inclusion. Um, I really, really want to do the, the hard work to build an inclusive school district, both for our educators and for our students. Uh, and, you know, I'm all about, I'm all about our educators as well. Um, you know, there, there, there's a little bit of overlap, but I think it's, uh, it's important that we uh, recruit and retain, you know, educators of color to the point that, you know, our, um, our demographics and our education and our educators reflect the uh, students that they, that they educate. And so um, hopefully, uh, like Dave said, I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, and I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Thank you. Hey, You're just in time. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm John Sessions. Uh, is that where we're at? Yes, yeah. that's oh, where we're yeah. at. All right. that's, how, uh, that's how you intro. All right. Um, hi, I'm Jonathan Sessions. Uh, I was born and raised here in uh, Boone County. Uh, forgive my, my tardiness. We were wrapping up uh, Education Day. So um, let's see. Uh, born and raised here in Columbia, Missouri, spent my entire K-12 uh, experience in the Columbia Public Schools and went to Russell, West, and Hickman. Uh, kind of went to Smith, and they were opening it that year I was there. Uh, went to the university, off and on. Uh, eventually earned a degree in education. Uh, while I was at the university, I opened a company, uh, and that company grew, and uh, it, it diverted me uh, from the original reason why I started at the university, um, but it's, it's where I found my career, uh, and it's what I do. My office is just right across the street here uh, in the guitar building. Um, I've, been in, you know, I've been here for 10 years on the Board of Education. Uh, I'm excited to have been a part of all the work we've done. Forgive me, am I looking for a timer? Is someone going to? Okay, hi, I'm sorry, I don't know where I was looking. I, um, uh, I, uh, I, I'm excited. Uh, the last 10 years for the Columbia Public Schools have been about catching up. Uh, when I got on, we were in a pretty bad fiscal place. Uh, we, had a, we were living in trailers. Um, and we've turned that around. Um, we are in uh, a much better place. We have a five-year uh, financial vision uh, that we add on every year. So we're operating with that five-year model. Uh, and uh, as I just shared, I took a tour of John Warner Middle School a few uh, few minutes ago. And uh, when we open that in August 2020, we'll be at sub-20 uh, trailers uh, in the district. And many of those trailers left will not be for classroom space. They'll be for teacher storage or, or, or teacher conference rooms and things of that nature. So uh, I'm Jonathan Sessions. I ask for your vote on April 7th. And thank you all for having a forum this evening. That was impressive. Just fly in and <laughs> Hold on. Well, my name is Helen Wade. Um, thank you very much for having me here. I do see some familiar faces. It's nice to see all of you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you tonight. Um, I think that this will be a very meaningful forum, and I think we're going to have a, an opportunity to discuss some of the tough issues that face Columbia Public Schools in this community. Um, I've lived here for 26 years. Um, I have spent the bulk of that time practicing family law. Um, and so I have said at prior forums, truly, both professionally and in my uh, role as a school board member, Columbia families really are the center of my life. Um, I believe in public school. Uh, without it, our community isn't strong. Without it, we're not educating the next generation to be tomorrow's leaders. Columbia Public Schools has done a fantastic job on lots of fronts. We have hired a teacher workforce that is second to none. But we have to retain that workforce. We have to be able to pay them in a way that matches the quality of the work that they do, not just for our kids, but for our community. We have a growing town. And with that brings many positives, but it brings challenges. And the Board of Education is in a position to rise to those challenges and to ensure that every single one of our kids and I'm purposely using that word, these are our kids, receives the best education that they can possibly get. We want every one of our kids to have an opportunity to be a leader. 
in terms of the role of a Board of Education and a member of a Board of Education over nine years of serving this community, um, proudly so, I've learned that it's a difficult role. Dealing with the needs of students, the emotional issues that confront the parents of those students, and the diverse needs of the staff, the administration, the parents, the students, the stakeholders, it's a challenge. I'm up for the challenge, and I hope you will allow me to serve for three more years. My name is Helen Wade. Thank you all. Um, we'll jump into moderated, moderated questions. We'll have a minute and a half for each of you to respond to these. There's a copy of them in front of you. If we reference anything, we, uh, you'll find it in your packet as well. So I will start. As a CPS board member, do you or would you see yourself primarily as a representative of the community or as a representative of the school system? Incumbent candidates, can you give an example of a time you found these two roles at odds and how did you ensure supporting both CPS and our students? If you don't mind, Helen, we'll start with you. So I don't mind at all. Okay. That's a very good question. Um, so the uh, school district and the members of the system themselves are also members of our community. And so when I say that we serve as members, the members of the community primarily, that does include the employees in our school district. Um, as an incumbent, I've had recent experience with um, there being sort of a juxtaposition or a tension between serving the community that doesn't work within our school district and the community that does. Um, and that is primarily with respect to the recording policy that has been discussed um, quite a bit uh, publicly and privately. Um, we have, as a board, I believe, an obligation to make sure that the needs of every person who touches the lives of children, um, is are, those needs need to be met. Um, and in addressing those needs, I'm listening to community members tell me that this is they want to be able to record their child's IEP meetings and they're calling upon us to modify our policy to allow for that pro in a, um, a specific way. I'm not talking about ADA recording, that's different. Um, and I'm listening to our teachers talk to me about how they're nervous. That's a tension um, that has uh, presented itself recently and I'm still working on how we balance those things effectively. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> Sorry, I, I, I didn't see you. <laughs> I keep forgetting to look over at you and then you're like, hey. We'll move down the line. Okay. Um, I would absolutely reiterate everything that Helen said. Obviously, that is the most recent example. Um, I would share uh, every time I run, I spend time reflecting on the things that we talked about through the three years before. Um, I went back to 10 years ago. And I look through you know, what, what were things that I had written down and typed up and, and talking points and, and responses and all of those things. Uh, one of them that uh, I kind of I chuckled at was a science specialist. And I, don't, uh, I don't remember, if, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers science specialists, but it was the, Steve Calloway's back there nodding. Uh, science specialists were what uh, we, we use, science was a time. We had math time, and we had reading time, and we had science time. And we had science specialists in all of our elementary buildings. And we, the school district was looking, as I got on the Board of Education, saying, it's, it's not effective. Uh, and so when we talk about, um, you know, as uh, maybe uh, at odds, uh, not only between the community, uh, but there were individuals within the district uh, that were at odds with each other as to whether or not this was a position we needed to keep, whether or not it was effective. Um, it was, and what we did was we took a moment, we reflected, we worked together, and we looked at data, and we made a data-driven decision. And I, I look back, and I shared last night, uh, to some folks I know were at uh, my kickoff party, uh, in, in the same way that we've renovated a lot of physical buildings, we've renovated science uh, in our district, and uh, of that I'm very proud. Um, <clears throat> I see it. I see it as both. I, at the end of the day, as board members, we're supposed to be advocates for, and so I think it's important to consider the positions and the uh, the wants and the needs and the desires of the community. Um, at the same time, obviously, we are supposed to be given the vision and the mission for our educators and our students, and so whenever there is conflicts of those two, 
I think when we're making those tough decisions, it's important to take into the input of the community, but when we're making decisions, we have to make decisions what's best for our kids and for our educators. Um, and you know that should be that should be the basis, that should be the driver of the decisions that we make, understanding that we're not gonna always please everybody. But I think that we can all agree, school, district, and community members, that when we're making decisions of what's best for our kids, um, I think that's the best way to go forward. So my view on the school board is that we are there to represent the teachers, parents, and students of CPS. Um, my philosophy is that our role is an adaptation of what the Senate's role is in, in U.S. government, right? Advise and consent. Well, the school board's role is to advise and advocate for. They're to advocate for those who have elected us to represent them. Um, we are there to ensure that there's a climate that's conducive to effective learning, um, to retaining those second to none teachers, uh, and ensuring that our students are supported and that they have an education that's going to prepare them for a future as productive members of society. Um, our role is to be there to help the superintendent and the school district, but to also say, this isn't the best idea, or this is a good idea, but let's, let's work on this issue. Let's change this part. Let's ensure that these folks who may not have a seat in the room, let's make sure their voices are heard before we implement this policy. And that's my view on that role. Thank you. Okay, for question two, we'll start with Mr. Session yep. so that everybody will get a chance to be number one in the lineup. Um, question two, the House Elementary and Secondary Education Committee is currently considering House Bill 1961, which would require schools to have at least one armed officer in every building during normal school hours. This bill also allows retired police officers, educators, military members, veterans, or volunteers <coughs> to serve this role, paid or unpaid. One, do you feel a state-mandated armed presence in schools is needed? Second, can you address this from an equity standpoint? That is, will all students feel safe with this presence? And third, are there other concerns for CPS with a bill such as this? Um, so to start, I 100% oppose this bill. 100% and have, uh, as it's been moving at the state legislature and, and just this week, uh, have been working uh, with representatives, um, other individuals in Jeff City, um, uh, spoken with Moms Demand Action on ways that the Columbia Public Schools uh, and our board colleagues on the ways that Columbia Public Schools can oppose this bill. Um, do I feel a state of mandated arms presence in schools is needed? No. Um, can we address this from an equity standpoint? I, I mean, there are so many issues with this bill um, that it's, the, the answer is it doesn't. This bill does not need to move forward, period. I, did, I don't even want to hypothetical in the equity. It doesn't need to happen. Um, are there other concerns? Yes. $93 million is the fiscal note on this bill. Unfunded mandate, $93 million. Yeah, right now, that while the state is telling us that we are being fully funded in the foundation formula, we are being underfunded $10 million in the transportation budget. Where do they expect that money from? And with something like this, it's just another unfunded mandate. It's another attempt for the state to say, Local control starts down in Jeff City and not here in our community. I agree with a lot of what Jonathan said there. Um, mostly from the standpoint, you know, while I appreciate national or state policies and state laws and appreciate national policies and national laws, particularly when it comes to funding um, our district, I think the, the more we relieve ourselves of local control, 
the worst that it is. So, um, so for that reason, you know, I, I, I'm not a fan of this at all. Um, you know, I would like to retain as much local control as possible um, for the things that I can imagine this bill is trying to cover. I feel like we as a community can address that on our own. So I'm going to try to make sure I hit each of these points. Um, we talked about local control, that decentralized control uh, for school districts making this choice. This should not be something that's coming from the state. This should be something that each uh, school district can decide. Two, no, I do not support putting armed officers in schools. Um, I have been on a number of pistol and rifle ranges um, during my time in the Marine Corps where people who are paid to be trained on weapon safety. Um, and we're talking about putting unpaid volunteers, giving them firearms or letting them bring their own firearms in. I don't care how much training you have, an accident is eventually going to take place. Um, and when you have upwards of 1,500 students in the school, you're asking for a, a tragic accident to take place. So no, I, I do not feel like we need uh, an armed presence in the school system. Uh, are there concerns for CPS and such a bill as this? There's, there are concerns there, and I don't want to jump ahead because it looks like we're going to talk about school resource officers on the next question, but um, there are concerns there with just having a police presence in the school. Um, I was at Alpha Heart the other day, and their principal, essentially, when he showed up, told the police officers who were sitting outside, you have to go. I don't want you here. If I need you, I'll call you, but you are here, in essence, almost intimidating some of the my students. So um, and I think we can touch on that on this next question. Like I said, I want to jump ahead and I've only got 10 seconds, so. <laughs> this is a terrible, terrible idea. When you consider the overall push to um, promote charter schools, voucher programs, um, that is a very, very real threat. Uh, that is bubbling through our state legislature at this point in time, and you pair that with the idea that's behind this bill, you have a horrific potential outcome. Um, there is absolutely, there's nothing about this bill that I, I think has any value whatsoever. It's a terrible idea. In terms of local control, one of the things that is important about local control is that we set policies. And policies can be changed. We can continue to have conversations about policies. But once a state law has been passed, it becomes an almost immovable object. Um, and we need that flexibility, particularly in a, in a uh, community like Columbia that is growing and changing rapidly. Um, in terms of equity, no, all students will not feel safe. Um, there's, no, there's no question in my mind about that. Um, in terms of other concerns, Jonathan uh, correctly said that this is a $93 million unfunded mandate for the state. It's a $2.5 million unfunded mandate for Columbia Public Schools alone. Um, from a fiscal imp impact point, it's completely unworkable, and there is no reward on the other side for the investment of those funds that, that could be spent so much better in other places. <clears throat> Mr. Horn, we'll start with you for question three. Columbia currently has contracted four school resources officers. While SROs were once viewed as a resource in reducing violence in public schools, many advocates for school discipline reform cite racial and ethnic disp disproportionality in school arrests, the criminalization of school misbehavior, and the possibility that the presence of SROs contributes to the school to prison pipeline as particular causes for concern. Please tell us what role you see SROs playing in schools today, and would you consider new models for policing in schools as set out by the ACLU, Department of Justice, and National Juvenile Justice Network? So to me, having an SRO is an opportunity to change the dynamics between community and policing. Um, if we're going to have them, um, they should be a specialized unit as they are today, and they should have a singular <laughs> focus and they should be playing well in the space of restorative justice. Um, I think it's a good opportunity for kids to have positive interactions with the police um, if they're gonna be there. Um, I understand um, having them there can lead to um, 
like you said, uh, school misbehavior is being criminalized. We have to be very, very careful with that if we're going to do that. Um, and if we're going to have them, we have to be careful about how we implement them. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, we cannot continue to have disparities amongst our different schools. So if we're going to have them, we can't put them in particular schools and not have them in other schools. Um, that said, I, I met Mr. Moore as well at Alpha Heart, and I, I love his approach to that. And so we also have to have our administrators have some autonomy when it comes to that as well. Um, so again, just to reiterate and bring it home, if, we, if we're going to have them, um, we need to be, make sure they're operating in the space of restorative justice um, and making sure that they're having positive interactions and building rapport and building relationships with our students. So I agree with Chris here. Um, I think SROs in this capacity are an extension of the community policing that we're trying to implement in the city. Um, having those officers there, interacting with students, um, not having what we would call disorderly conduct behaviors being referred to them. Disorderly conduct in a school could be anything from refusing to take your hoodie off to refusing to take your AirPods out, which my son does every day. <laughs> and I would prefer he not be referred to an SRO. Um, I think we have to have those standards and those policies on what can be referred to them. It's kind of the, the idea of if you have a hammer, you're gonna use it. And if you have an SRO in that school, then you're gonna see uh, those types of things referred to them. Um, there are models out there on how to do this correctly. Uh, Denver, Colorado, Clayton County, Georgia, they have certain training that not only SROs go through, but principals have to go through um, to be able to understand how they're going to interact with those officers. Um, I'll go back to uh, the Marine Corps. You do not see, when you see a Marine out in public in uniform, you don't see them in their camouflage and boots and their 40 pounds of body armor and Kevlar vest because that's not needed when they're out in public. You see them in a uniform. You see them in a nice shirt and tie in a uniform that's been issued to them. Same thing can happen with SROs. Give them some khakis and a shirt that identifies them as a police officer, and but lets them blend in with the community and blend in with that school, with the teachers, so that you don't have that traumatic experience when students are approached by them. You don't have an officer coming to you with them. I'm going to stop. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, School, resources, school resource officers should play um, a support role for our students in our schools to the extent that they are there. Um, police officers are in a unique position to develop relationships with students and to provide them with support and positive um, interactions that they may not otherwise have. However, um, there has to be a cooperation between the district and the officers to ensure that they're on the same page. Uh, within Columbia Public Schools, um, our school resource officers have recently gone through the, the our restorative practices training, which is a good start. Um, they are participating in our behavior matrix work that we have been working on um, for the past couple of years that is culminating in some real progress. I'm hoping I'm gonna get a chance to talk about that a little bit tonight. Um, and they are becoming more of a fabric of our support system rather than a police presence. Um, I read the article, I don't know if you all have had an opportunity to see it, but the article that was provided to us um, attached some sort of model um, ideas for the way in which school resource officers could be integrated into a school culture in a positive way. In Columbia, we do some of those, oh, I have only 10 seconds. We do some of those things. Um, I served on a committee back in 2013 that created an MOU between uh, law enforcement agencies, the juvenile court, et cetera. Um, we've got more to do. We can do it better, but we've started. Uh, I'd like to start by saying I apologize. I was wearing my name tag. Uh, I rushed in and didn't realize I was still wearing it. So um, sorry for that. Um, Helen touched on a lot of the bullet points I had. Uh, our SROs are going through restorative practices. Uh, today, um, I would walk through many, many Columbia Public School buildings, um, including one under construction. Uh, it was, it's named John Warner Middle School, and it's named after uh, an amazing officer of the Columbia Public Schools, and an officer that uh, I first met when I was an elementary school student. And he was, um, he was the officer that was teaching D.A.R.E. 
Now, aside from whether or not you think DARE is a good program or not, and I think we've kind of moved past that. Um, but what that was about was creating healthy relationships, healthy interactions with officers. Sometimes he was in full uniform. Sometimes he was in that khaki and a polo with the logo on it. Um, today, I walk through Jefferson, I'm sorry, I walk through uh, the Career Center and Rockbridge High School. Uh, and I can guarantee you, every time you walk down that main hall of Rockbridge High School, if you don't find Keisha Jackson standing somewhere in the foyer, talking with kids, joking, listening to music, you're going to find her in her office. And there's always kids in that office. They're sitting there. They're studying. They're listening to music. They're hanging out. They're grabbing a snack. They're talking. And they're building relationships so that there's a healthy relationship so that even if there's a problem, even if there's trouble, there's still a healthy relationship, and you can do the restorative practice part of it, the restorative justice part of it. Sorry, I know. Sorry. Okay, next question. We'll start out with you, Mr. Our city has seen a rise in the need for free and reduced lunches, a rise in homeless population. Most recently reported there are over 100 homeless students in our district, and I would surmise that's a low estimate because there are housing insecure people living in motels and <coughs> theoretically they're housed, but uh, not really. And with the state reduction in funding for buses, we may see a greater transportation need for students. How does Columbia address these issues, keeping in mind social equity practices within our schools? Right. So I'm gonna keep my eye over here. No, I don't want to. Sorry, I don't want to anger you. Um, so <laughs> I saw the wave, and that's when I realized. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be an issue that continues to rise as we move into the future. Um, right now, we have extremely low unemployment rates. Our underemployment rate is still high, but we also have stagnating wages. Um, and as we continue to move forward, this is going to be something that continues to need to be addressed. Um, I live on the south side of town. And my children go to Gentry and Mill Creek, which are, to be honest, pretty privileged schools. They don't have to deal with, or not deal with, they don't have as many of their peers that are on free or reduced lunches as, let's say, students who may live on the north side of town. Um, we have to have solutions that are targeted for certain schools. Um, that's going to be the issue. I know we tried to do city buses with transportation costs. That is an issue in and of itself. How, how, we, how do we keep those kids, our students, if they are on a city bus? What happens to them if something takes place? Those are the issues that we have to address. So if there's a disciplinary action, it has to happen. Who's responsible? Is it the district? Is it the school? Is it the city of Columbia? Um, these, are, these are tough questions that are going to have to be addressed in the future and are going to have to be done in an equitable and targeted way. And, uh, Hello. Me? Okay. So, um, in terms of addressing the potential for greater transportation or more accessible transportation for those who may not be um, attending one single school who may be moving around the district a lot, which is what happens when you don't have secure housing. You are going from building to building and place to place, um, and often, in doing so, finding yourself at different points in a curriculum um, in front of a teacher who may be teaching somewhat differently than the teacher from the classroom from which you came. Um, transportation is a challenge. We are underfunded by millions and millions of dollars by the state, and the, you pay for it. You pay for our transportation of our students. Um, if the, um, I like to look at data. To me, the, the solution to this problem may be a bit less about providing transportation, potentially, a little bit more about ensuring that these students can be, are able to stay in their home school during a period of time that they may be experiencing temporary housing instability. Um, I think it probably has, it, there is a need to address it from different perspectives. There is difficulty in taking a student who has a community around them in one part of town and taking them clear across to another part of town as well. 
So there's a balance to be struck there, and I think that we need to do um, a thorough job of finding out what really serves these students best. One of those things can also be to ensure that the curriculum and the teachers are in the same place at the same time during the year, so there's less disruption when they move from building to building. From a data standpoint, uh, a couple years ago, um, Dr. Stiebelman and I had a question, and it was a question of mobility. We looked at our highest mobile school, uh, school with a mobility of 75%. That means at the beginning of the year, 75% of, uh, by the end of the year, 75% of the kids that had started at that building are not there at the end of the year. And we ask a simple question. Uh, as someone who went and spent their entire K-6 career at Russell, we asked the question, how many kids in this building stayed K-5 and how are they testing? How are they doing? How are they performing? The answer was, out of this building of 400, 20. 20 kids over five years had stayed there the entire K-5 career. Those kids, 20, one was basic, and all of at the five-point scale, if you're not map test folk, <laughs> but uh, five-point scale, one was basic, which means performing on grade level, and the other 19 were advanced, proficient or advanced. And the majority of them were advanced. Which tells me if you're there in the building, you're getting an excellent education at even one of our most struggling schools because we have an amazing teachers. So what that tells me is when we get the opportunity to use McKinney-Vinto, which gives us a little bit of liberal definition, you can start counting housing insecure as, as homeless, you get extra resources. If we can keep a student in that stable classroom where they have a relationship with a teacher, that's the best chance we can give that child for success. Absolutely. No, to me, this is why inclusion is so important across our district. Um, our, our community is growing. We have so many great services to offer that people are coming to Boone County, coming to Columbia to receive these services. So you couple that with the university here, and you, you add that to all the opportunities outside of the services, people want to come to Columbia and our community is becoming more and more diverse. Um, so yes, funding is an issue to work around, um, but more importantly, working towards inclusion will help with a lot of these and making sure that each building across our district is a place that a student feels welcome. Um, each place across our district is a place where educators, all of our educators, feel welcome and included. Um, that way, when we have mobility issues or we have um, affordable housing issues where parents are forced to move from place to place, um, at least they know that when they, if they have to go to another building, they can expect the same treatment from the building with which they were in. Um, okay. Yep. Thank you. Our next question. CPS's contract with Catapult has come under fire recently, especially in regard to CORE's building and use of seclusion rooms. Please answer for current board members. Do you feel the current contract lays out education and disciplinary measures by Catapult well enough? And what would you like to see changed? For board candidates, do you feel like outsourcing the education and discipline of CPS students is something you would support? And what would you do differently? And, all, if you all can answer, do you feel there is sufficient communication between the board, Catapult, and the school superintendent in regard to the education and safety of children in the Catapult program? Am I, I believe, yes, I believe yes. Okay. Um, okay, so I, just to be clear, I am a candidate. I'm not speaking on behalf of the board as I answer these questions. Um, in terms of the current contract, uh, there isn't much substance in the current contract as it relates to the specific disciplinary practices and procedures undertaken by Catapult with respect to the students who attend that program. There may be a reason for that. Um, I'm gonna talk about that. When a student uh, is enrolled at the Catapult, in the Catapult program, they're enrolled there as a result of an IEP plan that has been put in place for that particular student. Um, often, in an IEP plan itself, there are specific uh, provisions in place for the manner in which a student's behavioral challenges may be appropriately managed. 
Um, and so for each student, that may be very, very different. And putting that language in the terms of a contract between two entities may not be an appropriate place for that information, which led me to ask, well, then where is it? Um, aside from being in the IEP plans themselves, the documents that are associated with these individual students, there is a very comprehensive um, layout of what Catapult does and what practices they employ, what tiered uh, behavior interventions are used, how they're used, and when they're used in the handbook that parents are given when they enroll their students. Having said all of that, um, I do think that communication needs to be improved and there needs to be clarity that these are, these are students that we are responsible for ultimately. There needs to be a clarity and an alignment between CPS policies and any, uh, any contractor's practices when interacting with our students. Um, and there needs to be some, as specifically with that contract, th there is wording in that contract that is inconsistent with the wording of our policies that needs to be clarified to the, and it needs to be the same. We need to be utilizing the same words, the same definitions to describe and discuss um, everything associated with that program. Sorry, I ran out. I've got so much more to say on this. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so again, I'm under the same time constraints for what is a, a large question and a large contract and a relationship. It's a relationship with Catapult that has existed already uh, with the High Roads program. Um, the goal of all of these programs is to help educate students to build self-regulation skills so that we can get back to a general general education classroom. Um, when, it, when it comes time to re uh, review this contract, uh, I do think there are th some things in that contract that need to be clarified, some ch points of communication, some relationships, how that um, points of contact need to be clarified. I also think there's definite some, uh, there needs to be some clear definitions, um, or sorry, some clear lines of communications for families and uh, what those relationships were for the families that are attending that program. So I would just, again, very handy to have an attorney on the Board of Education, and I would reiterate then uh, lean on her expertise in many, many ways and shapes and forms. Uh, but it is something that Every year when contracts come up, we need to take the time to review them and make them better and improve those relationships, again, under the lens of what is best for students. I'll start with the second question first about sufficient communication. I don't think that there currently is. I think that can be improved. Um, I think that's pretty, uh, pretty evident there. As far as outsourcing um, the services of education and discipline for our children, um, I wasn't in the room when the decision was made, so I'm going to trust that a lot of work went into making that decision. Um, that said, um, you know, I think that we had two groups of people that were upset when that happened. You know, the educators that were there um, probably didn't appreciate having to, having to be replaced. Um, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the parents, that uh, the students that received the services. Um, I think that... Um, you know, what would I do differently? Uh, you know, that's when we, yeah, I go back to the first question about making sure that we take in input from the community before we make these big decisions. Um, that said, I, I understand that these kids that are being services, serviced by, the, by Catapult, um, they specialize in what they do. And so I trust that if they're going to be there and the decisions were made to have them in place, um, we trust that they're going to be able to do what they should do. That said, they need to be held to the same level of accountability, the same standards as the rest of our CPS educators. Um, you know, I think the bigger issue here is that for the longest time, um, CORE was being used as a way to put kids in a place that people didn't want to deal with. And that's something that we need to correct. Um, in addition to making sure that whatever services or however we decide to go forward, um, standards are equal across the board. So I agree with that last statement that Chris made. That it feels as though having spoken to a number of parents whose children are in core that they feel as though their student was placed there because nobody wanted to deal with them. Um, and if we're going to talk about transparency being a value uh, for Columbia Public Schools, 
that communication needs to not just be between the board and catapult and superintendent, but also the parents. Uh, they need to know what's happening with their child. Uh, moving forward, I, I would, I'd be strongly against um, outsourcing both education and especially discipline um, to companies. Uh, this is something that we as a resource-rich school district should be able to do on our own. We should be able to find those educators in that space and develop those programs to be able to do this for our own students. In the meantime, while we are doing it now, we do need that strict oversight over education and curriculum. And discipline should remain with CPS 100%. Um, it should not be given to a company who, as we've all said, has different practices and values than we do. Um, like I mentioned about this, like the buses earlier, uh, what happens with a student that is in catapult when they're disciplined, uh, but not by the school district, but by this company? What does that open up for us? Uh, how do our students and our parents feel about it? So yes, strict oversight of that educational piece and complete control over the discipline piece. Okay, this next question is also a question from an audience member. So we'll oh. be able to satisfy both uh, the moderator and the audience. Um, HB 1565, written by Representative Chuck Basie, adds gender identity and sexual orientation to the list of current notice, refuse, and removal provisions and provide standing for civil action for failure to enforce compliance. In other words, parents must be notified if gender identity or sexual orientation will be included in any discussion of course material, and they must be able to opt out their student. The bill also changes the definition for course materials and instruction to include any information contained in any school-sponsored speech or in any presentation by a school-sponsored speaker, any display permitted by the school district intended to impart information to students. This seems to be a direct reaction to the LGBTQ pride poster incident at Gentry Middle School last year. So we'll begin with Mr. Sessions. Do you feel a bill like this is needed? And what would that mean for groups like the Gay Straight Alliance, for instance? I get to start with all the legislative ones. Uh, um, again, I'm 100% opposed to this bill. Um, I have a client um, who, um, based on the business loop and has a sign that regularly change. I recommend all of you driving down the business loop this evening and. Uh, taking a look at that sign, he's got some opinions on it um, uh, that I agree with. Uh, so the, uh, one of the things when I came on the Board of Education that I pointed out was we had a pretty egregious misalignment in policy. Um, sexual orientation was a protected class for uh, uh, harassment um, it was, you could not harass based on sexual orientation, but it was not protected for, staff was not protected, um, nor were students. Uh, when I got on the Board of Education, we, or, uh, within a few years, um, in, in my 10 years on the board, we have added uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression as a protected classes for student bullying, any staffer in our district, as well as it's um, prohibited in our AC, our harassment clause. So that is one of the things that I'm proud of. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, um, while discussing this as a board member, if that might have been considered a uh, school-sponsored speech, um, in which case I might have been in violation of this bill. Um, no, it is not in needed. Uh, I think it is important to communicate to parents in general, when there are things regarding health and sexuality, that is our general practice. Now, um, uh, the fact that this is written in the way it is, is clearly an attack on citizens, our neighbors, our community, members of our community. And uh, it's just 
another frustrating and disappointing thing coming out of Jeff City? Uh, no, it's not needed uh, for many reasons. Uh, first being that, again, we've got policies, we've got local control, and we don't want to give that up. But more importantly, you know, you're going to continue to oppress and marginalize people. Um, and so um, absolutely not. Um, that's the last thing we want to do, particularly, um, you know, we want to do the opposite. We want to be inclusive. Um, I agree when we have certain materials that we that are tough to talk about, we should let people know. But beyond that, that doesn't prevent us from talking about them. Um, so, no, don't need it. So, I know Chuck Basie. We have a connection as Marines. And I will say that I don't have any words to describe how disappointed I am that he would even propose a bill of this nature. Um, the idea that we would need to be able to give somebody the notice, refusal, and removal provisions um, because of someone's identity is wholeheartedly insane to me. Um, I view it through the context of what Ruby Bridges went through when she was integrating schools. Um, as a black man who is married to a, his wife is white, um, on the day that we have finally, as a nation, begin the process of making lynchings uh, illegal and a federal crime. Um, this is not something that we should be talking about. Um, suicide rates for LGBTQ students are almost 50%. And what you have done is essentially told them that your life is not worth the time. Um, you're going to create an atmosphere where those rates are going to increase. And it's, I'm sorry, I'm just I'm trying to tone down a little bit, but this is, this is a, <laughs> a subject that I feel yes, is extremely frustrating. This is a, a topic that I feel very strongly about. Um, so no, the, the simple answer is no. No, it's not needed. And it doesn't seem to be a response, it is a response. Um, there was a personal public comment made by Representative Basie to, in, a, in a public way at the school board meeting that directly is related to this. He didn't want his granddaughter to have to share a bathroom with someone who was transgender. That's, that's where this is coming from. So not only is it not needed, it not only does it marginalize and oppress those who are very vulnerable to begin with, the state sets curriculum. This law is ridiculous. It, it, the state tells us what we are going to teach. It doesn't govern what kind of extracurricular activities our schools may allow. Um, it's ill-conceived, it's illogical, and it's disrespectful. In front of each of you is a list of job duties as described for the equity officer for CPS as they relate to planned initiatives for the district. Quickly, I'll go through them for the audience. Analyze district-wide policies and procedures to ensure the district's emphasis on achievement, enrichment, and opportunity. Monitor and analyze attendance and discipline data. Work with colleagues to seek alternatives and reduce disparities. Direct district-wide equity teams. Direct district-wide restorative practices initiatives. Ensure compliance with policies and laws related to the McKinney-Vento Act. Ensure compliance with local, state, and federal laws. Serve on the Board of Education Policy Committee. Establish and maintain positive community relationships. Promote a well-trained, committed, and motivated staff. Do you feel CPS is meeting these expectations? And what areas do you feel the district can improve upon? As a follow-up, if you have time to answer, <laughs> what type of information would you expect to be in an equity work group report, and how often would you expect that group to meet? So I, I've met with, uh, with Carla London, and you know I had the opportunity to hear her plans and the work that she's implemented and the work that she's done in the time that she's been here, going from what was nothing to where we are now. And the work that she's trying to do, she's trying to, we as a community, we as a school district are trying to undo generational wrongs. And she is, she is working extremely hard, her district is working extremely hard to implement policies and initiatives to help our educators um, 
mitigate their biases, understand the impacts of uh, the biases they bring into, the, in their, into their classrooms and what it has on our students. Um, and, you know, this is one of those spaces where um, people want change right now, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, but this is also the same space where it takes time to undo a lot of these wrongs. And so I think that the work that's being done right now is good. Um, I do still think there's opportunities to improve. I think it should be a, a number one priority um, because it directly affects our it directly affects the education of our students. It directly affect affects the, the ability to retain teachers of color. Um, and so I think this is utterly important. Um, are we meeting? Are we meeting them right now? I think we're working very well close to meeting them, um, but we still have some room to grow. So Chris, Chris met Carl London. I'm looking forward to meeting her. Um, one question I'm going to have for her is, do you feel like there's too much on your plate? Um, have you been given too many responsibilities? Uh, as equity and diversity officers have become a national trend, what we've seen is most fail because they're given too many responsibilities and they are unable to focus on what they should be, which is equity uh, and restorative practices. Um, are we meeting these expectations? What areas do we feel like, areas do I feel like we can improve upon? I think the overall climate. Um, when you talk to black and brown teachers in this school district, they feel like they're not listened to. Um, and the thing that I think we've, we're missing is that climate. So when we talk about climate, my son goes to Gentry. What took place at Gentry earlier this year with the, the fake website? Um, and the words that were used on there. Climate in that situation means addressing the words that were used, not the fact that it was technology. Climate is going back to those teachers and saying, you brought these issues to the forefront before and we, we didn't hear you, we didn't acknowledge you, and it happened. Climate is ensuring that, and I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna pull the curtain back for you here, when you're a black person and you walk into a room, the first thing you do is you try to figure out how many other black people are in this room. And when it's only one or two, that climate becomes very uncomfortable, even just walking into the room. So that is a reality that some of us live with. Um, ensuring that we are able to hire, retain, and support more teachers of color so that that climate changes, so that those hard conversations that we're having about equity and restorative practices actually take hold because it's difficult to give you in three hours the nuances that I've had at 30 years as a black man. That's how you change the climate. So, um, boy, there's not enough time for this answer. Okay, I'll be quick. So, um, Carla London does work very, very hard. Um, and the truth of her job is that she's charged with changing the hearts and minds of men and women. And that does take time. Um, I, I think that going through the list and checking off whether or not this or that is met is probably less useful than telling you what I know she's doing. Um, currently, all of our secondary administrators have been through restorative practices training, every single one of them. We are training our elementary administrators every single month so that they are all trained. Um, there is a, I think a 14 member team that has done training around the community um, with the police department, um, with the health department, uh, with, the, with Columbia College, with Stevens College, um, at our parent university. But it's an ongoing uh, endeavor. It's never going to be done. If I sat here and said every one of our teachers has been trained, I wouldn't be going and that's it, right? It's something that we as a district are willing to take on, to pursue, and to be leaders in our field. We're willing to say, hey, it's really hard to measure the degree to which we've been successful in changing those hearts and minds. Um, you know, we need to create a culture of inclusion, which means to me that each student, each teacher, each administrator and each community member feels comfortable bringing their authentic selves into our buildings, feels comfortable 
and welcomed and listened to and um, really and genuinely feels like a part of the fabric of the district that we are all here talking about. Um, can we do better? Absolutely we can. Are we willing to look at where we can do better? Yes. Um, it, again, it's an ongoing endeavor that we will never be fully finished with, ever. Equity work is a never-ending marathon. Um, everyone, just take a minute. Think of your current age. How many years, how many months, how many days, how many minutes, how many seconds until this moment? And all of that time, you've been socialized. You've been socialized by family, people you love. You have been socialized by friends. You have been socialized by society. You have been socialized by the news media. You have been socialized by what you see on TV, now the internet, whatever's on the end of that four inch screen. That didn't happen overnight. That was your entire life. Equity work is helping everyone recognize that that socializa socialization that we all have experienced is, is genuine. And however that path that got you here, whatever that path was, um, recognizing that equity work is taking a moment to reflect on it and thinking about how it impacts your biases, how it impacts how your brain works, uh, and, and how that might be an error. And, and as, as the only current board member that is an equity trainer, um, and now as uh, our district has more equity trainers than even St. Louis, where the community that we've been going to to get equity trained through NCCJ, um, we know this work won't happen overnight. None of us were socialized overnight. No one became a racist overnight or became homophobic overnight, or became ageist, or whatever the ism is. That didn't happen overnight, and breaking that down takes time. And that is the hard work that Columbia Public Schools is doing, and Carla London is leading that charge. And I'm very happy that she is the captain of that ship. I think in the interest of leaving time for the audience to ask follow-up questions, we're going to move on to some of the written questions they've submitted. Sure. Yes. That's fine. I'm sitting here contemplating my answers to the next piece, though. <laughs> it, it ties oh, in nicely. Practices. It ties oh, in so. nicely with what Peggy, right. the questions Peggy has, so if you yeah. can include. <laughs> yeah, we were going to ask about restorative justice, but I believe that these two audience questions will tie in with that very well. One is about changes that you'd like to see in the way CPS handles discipline problems, quote unquote. And the other one is about a, um, a bifurcation in the way our district works. That is, if you look at the triple E or gifted program, at the demographics of that program, you see middle and upper middle class white and Asian students being overrepresented. And if you look at the discipline data, you see students of color overrepresented, or actually African American and Latinx students overrepresented. So how would we deal with that in terms of addressing um, both the general pattern of discipline, um, the way we handle discipline, but also the way we've divided who gets in trouble and who gets to be in a special program. And we'll start with you. So I spent the last few weeks uh, visiting some of our schools, um, and some of them, with the administrators that are in charge, are there's some interesting laboratories for different things that are going on. So I went to Alpha Hart and Hickman, and I've taken to calling these measures that they implemented the trustee Husky and, uh, and CUPE models after their, um, after their mascots. So at Alpha Hart, they have essentially gotten rid of in-school suspension and lunch detention. Um, 
They have instead said, why are you in this class? Why are we sending you here instead of just putting you here? Um, so instead of sending someone to ISS because they had behavior issues, you go to a counselor and you talk out why you had these behavior issues and if they need to bring the teacher in to mediate, then that's what they do. And then they send you back to class so that you are not out of the classroom setting. Um, you're still doing work. At Hickman, they have essentially what is called a dean model where they have three deans, um, each is given a responsibility for a certain aspect of student life. And under one dean, there are three uh, uh, health counselors. So when a student has an issue, they're not routed to the assistant principal or the principal for disciplinary action first. They go to one of these counselors and they do the exact same thing they're doing at Alpha Heart, where it is an intervention of what's happening at home, why are you having these outbursts, what's going on, how can we solve this? How do we get you back into the classroom setting so that you don't end up in ISS or out of school suspension, where you're going to eventually end up in that school to prison pipeline? They're trying to catch them early so that later on we don't have to catch them and incarcerate them. We're trying to catch them now so that they become productive members of society. Um, the great models that are taking place right here in our own school, uh, those are things that we should be looking at and trying to adopt at the district level. Me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, this is a good question, uh, in, and I'll do my very best to be quick. <laughs> so uh, the Columbia Public Schools has recognized that there is a bifurcation and a disproportionality in terms of the representation of the students in gifted and accelerated learning environments and those that are subject to discipline. I asked um, our data guru today to tell me, well, what, what is the number? Well, I'll tell you what it is. If you are a black student, you are 4.1 times more likely to be in out-of-school suspension within Columbia Public Schools. That's the number. And it's worse than what the Tribune reported because their math was wrong. But that's the number. That's a problem, OK? What is Columbia Public Schools doing about it? Well, um, over the last two years, we have uh, embarked on an, a very difficult mission of assembling a way to make our behavioral interventions uniform, fair, and reasonable. That's really hard to do when you're dealing with humans, okay? We've developed and are still developing a multi-tier approach to address acting out in a classroom. Are you accidentally dropping your book or have you just, you know, hit somebody in the face, right? How is a teacher to respond to that? To reduce the subjectivity in the manner in which teachers deal with behavioral issues in children. It doesn't take away the subjective element of trying to divine why is a child acting the way a child is acting. And so that matrix that is still being developed and you will be, we will be seeking community input, we will be seeking outside information, okay? That we're not there yet, um, but we will be seeking it. The other piece is equity training, restorative practices, so that when a teacher is called upon to make a determination, what did that child mean? That we aren't taking into consideration elements such as the color of your skin. Instead, you are able to consider that whole child, where that child comes from, what his or her experiences may be like, and make better decisions. Sorry, I'm out of time. You, you can pick up. I, I will pick up. And uh, Helen has, has touched on a lot of things uh, that are very important. And uh, David is exactly right. There are a lot of really great things happening in the district. And uh, actually, some of the places that he's referenced are already working and, and the places where we're looking at the behavior matrix, which we spent an entire board meeting talking about. And I wish the media would have shown up. It, it's on the website. It's, it's on, on the website. website. Yeah. Um, so, um, and what that's going to look like. Uh, you you um, enrolled it into one question, but uh, I do think that you can start to address some of the disproportionality of uh, gifted. Let's take a minute there. Let's, the way that we approach that now, uh, you take a test. Anybody ever here had a bad test day? Okay, that's how we base gifted, is the A test, single time, one time. Um, it's a test that you have to opt into. Not everybody is given this test. You have to kind of seek it out, so which already shows some level of engagement uh, from a parent, a parent that has the opportunity and involvement. Um, so that is, that is definitely a challenge. It is, 
And then you look at students that may struggle in one area but are gifted in others and they can't shine in the way that we currently look at our model. And um, I know that there are people that love the way that we approach gifted education, but uh, I have some struggles with the fact that it pulls kids out of our current classrooms, moves them into other buildings. Uh, education often doesn't uh, progress on those days in elementary level because half of the class may be gone or a portion of the class may be gone. Um, so there's a, a lot of issues with it uh, from parent engagement, um, also, you know, not recognizing the way that all of us may be gifted, even though we may struggle or have challenges in other ways. Um, so that's the gifted piece that uh, I don't think we've had a chance to. Uh, one of the things that I think is the most important, uh, 10 seconds, one of the things that I think is most important about, um, about the behavior matrix is it pushes things back into the classroom. Um, and it builds a relationship with the teacher and the student. That's first. Restorative justice doesn't work if there's not a relationship to restore. That is where it starts. And you have to work on building that relationship. That teacher has to work with building relationships. And that's the first part of the behavior matrix is not just, there's an issue, go to the office. There's an issue, go to the office. It's about making sure there's a relationship. I'm sorry, I'm going over time. A lot in that question. Oh, question. So um, looking at the district scorecard, Last year, uh, the goal was to have 600 or less or fewer out of school suspensions. There are 810. 821. 11 more. Um, and when you look at it, for our black students, the goal was 150. There were 414. Um, attendance goal was 92%, 73%. So the point is, we have to keep kids in the classroom to educate. So. Out of school speech doesn't work, in school speech doesn't work. What I've seen in my visits to schools, um, I've seen some really good practices though. I don't think, you know, we, we spend a lot of time looking at numbers and talking about the bad things, but we should talk more about the good things. And so some of these restorative practices I've seen, particularly um, at Benton and Parquet, they got this real cool uh, concept called conscious discipline. And so um, the whole concept is, you know, particularly if you have two kids that have a conflict, they have this cool little mat, you know, kids. You, you hurt my feelings, or well, this is how it made me feel. You work towards together, you embrace. And so um, that's one thing. Another thing they have, um, they've gotten rid of in-school suspension rooms, and they have recovery rooms where kids can go. You know, they were upset in the classroom. Student said something, teacher said something. Come here, let's talk about how you feel. And the whole concept is you're in there 15 minutes max, and let's get you back into the classroom where you can learn. Um, those are the sorts of practices that we're talking about in making sure that our kids can achieve. Um, I'll, I'll piggyback on, on Alpha as well. Um, at Alpha Heart, um, he wants to bring AVID down to the elementary level. Okay, AVID's a program that identifies students that are really, really close. You know, we're talking students that are getting B's but should get A's, they just need that extra push. Um, right now it's in our middle schools, it's in our high schools. He wants to bring it down to the elementary level. That's a game changer. Um, also at our high schools right now, um, one of our high schools is intentionally identifying students that should be in AP programs and are making it so that they can get there. And they're not only putting students of color in these programs, they're making sure when they walk into a room, they see other kids that look like them. Because like David mentioned earlier, that is different. You walk into a room and you don't see anybody that looks like you, you want to get out of there. And so they are intentionally identifying these students, intentionally making sure that educators and resources are available so that when they are in these AP classrooms, they stay in these AP, AP classrooms. Thank you. Our third audience question, um, they write, thank you for being here. My son is in the DI program for children on the autism spectrum in CPS. The program and staff are fantastic, but we just found out that it is moving yet again to another school site next year. Children on the spectrum often struggle with change and need routine. Are there ways to maintain more consistency with these programs, even as the district grows? And I believe we're starting with Helen this time. Um, yes. Particularly of students who are on the spectrum, it is an issue to change where these children are located, especially on a repeated basis. Um, it is also true that in order to meet the needs of students, we can't always have those programs that are necessary to a group of students in every single building. Um, I think that it is, we need to do a better job of making sure that the students' needs are placed 
first. Um, and particularly in terms of those kind of classrooms, finding and keeping a, com a constant common place, staff, um, and environment is important. It, ha it is an educational element for those particular students. Um, are there alternatives? There's always alternatives. There are always ways to do it better. Um, and this is probably a really good example of how we need to do it better like now um, and find a home for that program to stay. Uh, I agree with Helen um, wholeheartedly. It is, um, I think there are a couple things uh, that are important as we continue to um, build new buildings um, and renovate old buildings. We are making sure that we are including the, when, while focusing on issues of making sure the buildings aren't just compliant but accessible, we are making sure that we have the facilities in each of these buildings so that we can house more programs uh, throughout the district without having to have um, central hubs or move students around. Uh, the other thing that I think uh, is important is we talked about a, a CPAC, um, and I forget the, uh, what the acronym stands for, but it was, um, I, I'm, Laura's back there mumbling, the <laughs> Special Education Parent Advisory Committee, I think Political Action Committee, so forgive me. Uh, but it's, it's about getting uh, district leaders, teachers, SPED teachers, um, and families and stakeholders together to work together um, and, and focus on communication and dialogue. And uh, it, as we move towards uh, having uh, a CPAC, uh, I think, and as we have one, um, we'll have an opportunity to get more parent voice and, um, and, and, and be better able to hear and listen. Uh, and, I, and that's why I'm, I'm uh, e eager to have that implemented. So. Uh, to me, it's, it's the whole infrastructure surrounding special education needs to be addressed. Um, you know, uh, when we talk about fostering an environment in, of inclusion, um, it's easy to forget about those that are in the margins. And I feel like that's what's happening here. Um, I, had, I heard a story about uh, a parent who, whose kid, same spectrum, and they were transitioning from elementary to middle school, and the, the parent was told, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay, your kid's taken care of. Um, kid gets to middle school without a transition plan, shows up day one, first time in a new building. Um, for anybody that has the, has the privilege to be able to move from space to space without having to worry about it, it's completely different. Um, and it was completely different for this kid. And this child was in their, their middle school for two weeks um, before they were referred to a different building because they were one of the kids that nobody wanted to deal with. That's what we're talking about that's happening. Um, and it was just too easy. Um, for, for that kid just to be taken or to be sent to core um, as opposed to trying to work with and have a plan implemented um, to begin with that that parent was advocating for. And so um, I said all to say, you know, that's where we need to do the work. We really need to take a hard look at our infrastructure around our special education programs and everything surrounding it. So I just heard three great answers um, and they all had issues, some things in there that we should be looking at. Um, with an eye toward the future, we do need to be looking toward providing those resources in each school. Um, as Helen mentioned, you know, that is something that we'd have to look at the budget and resources for, but the resources are there. Um, it is difficult. As Chris said, I've had the privilege of moving around a lot. Every two years I was in a different school, but I wasn't on the spectrum. Um, when I showed up to a school, I knew what I was. I knew where I was going. I knew where to go. I knew who to talk to. Um, when you are moving these students constantly, it does become a problem, um, and it is an issue of 
are we removing them from the area that they actually live in? So are we taking them away from the students that they see outside when they're playing in their neighborhood every day and sending them to a different school? Um, are we separating them from their siblings in some case? Um, that, that is something that we have to keep an eye towards and ensure that we're paying attention to and making a priority so that we can help solve that issue. Okay, we um, beg your uh, indulgence to, can we do one more question? One more audience question? Yes. Okay. Um, this one will start with uh, Mr. Sessions. Mm -hmm. um, and this one is, what are you doing to dismantle the ways that white supremacy shows up in your life and influences your work on the board? Um, well, uh, simply recognizing my privilege. Um, and uh, I have done a lot of self-reflection and uh, um, self-dismantling. Uh, as I went through the NCCJ equity training program. Um, it's, um, I know there, I, there were um, a couple other uh, trainers um, in, in the room, and I think that um, uh, most of us would share um, that it is a uh, difficult and cathartic uh, experience to uh, especially for someone um, who sits in such a position of power as me, um, a, a white, cisgendered man um, of middle class, of, of reasonable socioeconomic status. Um, it, I have a lot of privilege, and I, I recognize that. Um, and uh, what's important to me is that I use my position of agency, um, to, to help those who are targeted. Um, as, a, as a black cisgendered male of um, decent socioeconomic status, um, I have the complex path of navigating in between spaces. Uh, you know, there are some people that look like me that say they don't accept me for who I am. There are some people that don't look like me that tolerate me in spaces. And so what I've learned in my experience, you know, um, when it comes to white supremacy, it's a delicate topic and fragile topic because some people have the privilege of pretending like it doesn't exist. Um, some people <coughs> write out, embrace it, and they love it. Um, some people just don't know they quite frankly don't know. They don't believe it's a thing that exists, and that's real. And so, to me, I approach that with, with a lot of grace um, because it is, it, it's, you know, I'm not trying to not offend people's sensibilities, but it takes a lot of trust to be able to look at somebody that doesn't look like you and say, hey, I'm not saying that you're racist or you're white supremacist, but what you just said and what you just did mm -hmm. certainly seems racist and white supremacist. That's how I interpreted that's how I, that's how I took it in. And so the short answer is building relationships, building rapport, building trust so you can so you can address those typical when you when you have those points of encounter, you can address them in a truthful and honest way to truly affect change. I'm gonna touch on both of those comments, because they're both correct. Um, as Chris said, as a black man who went to college and served in the Marine Corps as an officer and has a good deal of privilege himself, um, there are two worlds that I have to navigate, and it is difficult. Sometimes I speak too well. Sometimes I don't speak well enough. Um, and it's difficult. And raising three biracial children, um, it's, it's a greater challenge than even what I feel like I faced trying to figure out how to teach my son how to navigate the multitude of worlds that he now has to, to live in. Um, as Jonathan said, um, you know, this is, I'm from the South. And in the South, people will let you know, to your face. Um, I can remember being in fifth grade and, and being part of the march that to remove the Confederate flag from the top of the South Carolina State House. And they took it down and they put it at eye level in front of it. 
That was a, that was a, yeah, we'll help you out. We'll put it right here where you can see it. There was no hiding that. In other parts of the country, in the Midwest, it's a little more coded. You have to pick it out and you learn how to pick it out. And when it is that coded, you have to be able to respond and say, like Chris said, hey, I know you said that. Maybe you don't know what that means, but let me explain to you why that's a problem. Or I know you just made that comment about that person over there, but uh, that wasn't cool. Here's why that's not cool. And if they have an issue with it, I, I spoke with a principal, um, and I'm sure you can guess who it is at this point. Um, but they, they said, you know, at some point, you stop being afraid to say something. And the problem is, it's when you stop being afraid is when you stop caring about what happens to you. And that's unfortunate um, because it shouldn't be that way. I shouldn't have to feel I no longer care what happens to me or what you say about me to be able to speak up and say something. So I appreciate Jonathan. I appreciate Helen being here with us and, and addressing all these issues. So it's always hard to go last because this group has very a lot of insight. But, um, you know, I grew up very much like David. I moved, I went to six different elementary schools, two different middle schools, and four different high schools. Um, and I was always the new kid, right? And there was nothing more terrifying in the world to me than walking into a lunchroom. It was the most horrible place possible. You don't know where to sit. You didn't see anybody familiar. You felt out of place. Um, but I was out of place because I was new, not because of something that was inherently me. Um, throughout the course of my being on the board, um, I have uh, gotten deeper and deeper into the question of who I am and confronting the biases I have, um, the assumptions that I make on a daily basis. I actually uh, spent a week <laughs> writing down as I'd, th I'd see someone and I'd think something. And I wanted to see, what, who at, am I this person? Am I the person that I think I might be? And the things that I would thought, thought and confronting those things that just occur to you, not because someone told you to think it, not because somebody sat you down at some point and said, hey, this is, this is how you should see these things, was absolutely incredible to me. Um, I'm a student. I'm learning. I'm actively learning. I'm engaged in not just as a school board member, in equity training and in learning about restorative practices as a member of the bar, um, learning how bias invades our judicial system. Um, but just as a human being and a business owner, um, I'm not, I don't advertise these things because I'm not doing any of this because I want some sort of approval because of it. I'm doing it because it has to be done. Um, I'm learning how to hold other people accountable uh, by helping them see that their words may convey something that maybe doesn't represent who they are, but that is part of making change. Making just one person, make, once you realize yourself, what you, the lens through which you see the world may not be as clean as you thought it was, but allowing someone else the opportunity to see that has the potential to really start to affect change. And that's really what we have to do as members of a school board, human beings, members of a community. I'm sorry, I saw you waving it. I think uh, we're over our planned time. <laughs> um, if anybody has a burning question that they didn't get to write down, you're welcome to stand up and say or ask. Please. So um, in uh, the media, we uh, saw that there was a recent uh, incident with a six-year-old child who was uh, arrested um, or, you know, in cuff by a uh, local police department. Um, I just want to know how you all, again, going back to those seclusion uh, practices or instances like those, how do you all uh, think that the district there in that city, I can't remember where, but should have handled that? Um, and if there are some, some type of repercussion or uh, instances that um, those, those individuals should definitely be considering um, as uh, leaders in their, in their communities. 
So we ended with Helen, I believe. Yes, we did. So, mm -hmm. John, or no, Jonathan started there. So. How about you? I get to go last. <laughs> yes, it does. That's right. That's right. Uh, I'm sorry, it happened to where? Orlando, Orlando. Florida. Orlando, Florida. Thank you. Listen, without, without knowing the specifics of the story, I can tell you this. Um, it had to be a pretty egregious act um, to put a six-year-old in cuffs, okay? Um, that, that kid better present an extreme danger to himself, to others, to the police officer who has a weapon and is, I'm assuming, is bigger than him. Um, so I'll start there. Um, if there, there, you have to look at the totality of the circumstances, okay, um, in, in any situation. And that applies here in Columbia. Um, when we talk about restraints and seclusions, um, you know, there are policies in place for which those should be used, and there are trainings required for those that are using them. And, you know, when they're used, we have reporting practices that are supposed to happen as well. And so it should be absolutely clear that if a kid had to be restrained for whatever reason, it should be absolutely clear why, how it was done, and what the result of it was. Um, it's an unfortunate thing that we have to have them, but we're talking about humans as well, okay? Um, we as adults understand when we make a mistake and we do wrong, there's punishments for that. We got little humans that unfortunately do the same thing, so that's why we have to have these practices. But when we have them, there should be clear results of when they happen. Um, and when we get to the extreme of putting children in handcuffs, um, there better be a very, very clear reason why. I'm going to look at that through the lens of law enforcement. I have had some law enforcement training, and there's totality of circumstances. You have to look at that in every single situation. Um, but I'll reiterate, just to bring it home, for putting kids in handcuffs, it needs to be egregious, and it needs to be absolutely clear. And everybody sitting in this room, when they look at that situation, they should all say, yeah, that, that was happened properly. I'm going to touch on a few things. Um, Question me, so I, I saw that video. Um, seeing a six year old in the back of a police car crying, begging to be let out is not something anybody wants to see. Um, the question is, like Chris said, why that happened? How do we get to that point? Um, do we have educators and counselors who are trained in de escalation techniques? Um, I have a teacher friend who has taught elementary school and high school, and he said, if a fifth grader tells you they're gonna hit you, you can pretty much ignore that. Said, a junior in high school tells you they're gonna hit you, you need to watch it back as you go into the parking lot because you might get hit. Um, there are different aspects for different grade levels on how those threats are perceived. As Chris said, there's almost no reason I can think of why you would put a six-year-old in handcuffs. Um, I have a seven-year-old out in that room over there. I can't imagine her needing to be put in in can't imagine the police need to be called on her at that point. So to your second part of that question, what kind of recourse is there? Um, we talked about data a lot. Are we tracking which teachers are putting these referrals in? Which teachers are needing that SRO's help more often than not? Um, is it the same teacher all the time? Is it just this was a one-time in, one incident with this student and this teacher? I think. Those are things that we can track and figure out. You know, teacher A seems to always have to have a referral there. Why is that? Are the referrals warranted? Or is it just because, like I said, you got a hoodie on and you said no, and I called the SRO on you? Yeah, that's, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. No, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Alec. Like. Um, so. <laughs> this child was having a temper tantrum, um, and the teachers in that particular school knew that this child was suffering from the secondary side effects of uh, sleep apnea. And um, ultimately, I believe that one of the officers involved in the incident was fired, um, and it clearly, clearly should have absolutely never happened. Here's why I think this is a, a teaching moment. Um, teachers inherently want to do right by their students. 
I believe that. I particularly believe that about the teachers that we have working in our community. No teacher wants to restrain a child. No teacher wants to isolate a child. And no teacher wants to seclude a child. And as Chris said, we have policies in place that if followed uh, with fidelity, prescribe that these are, these are interventions of last resort. They're not to be used in a punitive way. Um, there are other ways to handle a child who's having a temper tantrum because they're overtired that doesn't involve a call to the local law enforcement. It is an unpleasant truth that some of our students are dangerous to themselves. Some of our students are dangerous to others. And there are times when it is necessary to intervene with a physical touching. It does happen, and for me to sit in front of you and say, oh, no, no, it's not necessary, we can completely do away with it, it wouldn't be true. Um, I don't want to create an environment in Columbia Public Schools where teachers are so afraid to intervene in reasonable ways when a child does present a danger to themselves that the first thing they do is call law enforcement. I don't ever want to see something like that happening in Columbia Public Schools. And I do think our teachers need the appropriate training, the appropriate support, the appropriate backing to be able to handle all of our students' needs and to respond to them so our kids can stay in school um, and have an opportunity to learn. Sorry. Last is so easy. Um, I, I, forgive me, I've been running since about 5.30 this morning and uh, I have a lot of red dots on my phone, so I have not had an opportunity. I kind of saw this headline fly across my screen earlier today. I haven't had an opportunity to actually see that particular situation, and so I cannot respond to that directly. So for that, I'm sorry. Um, I would reiterate Helen's comments tenfold. Um, you talk to any teacher and you ask them those questions, and you add uh, to the ones that Helen asked, like, do you want to have children arrested? And the answer is going to be no. Uh, the um, if we are talking about that level of intervention, it must be, as Chris said, a, a situation so extreme, student at serious risk of injuring themselves, other students, or, or adults in the room, um, that, that everyone in this room says, if they w witnessed the situation and were there, said this was the right intervention. Uh, but it must be that extreme. Um, it is not something that any teacher wants to have happen. Let's thank our candidates and the team for joining us. We appreciate all of your time and we look forward to the election. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> April 7th. April 7th. <laughs> April 7th. <laughs>